when we see God moving through the Bible and we see as what last week we were talking about the seed that breaks out in you and multiplies, that same seed in the Bible is within us. That seed is our salvation. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that empowers you to succeed in everything you do in life. I believe like that. My system, my system and my government is not what I see, but it's the word of God. I go by the word of God. Everything around my life, if I'm lacking in any area of my life, I go by the word of God. The word of God is what governs my life. And if you're here today and you are saved by and redeemed by Jesus, that should also be your government. Can you give me an amen? That should be the one that guides you and directs you is the word of God. And when I start looking at certain areas of the word of God, sometimes it's hard to believe some and sometimes it's hard to believe some others. Some get contradicted, some get twisted, some uh, are changed by the ideologies of how man sees the word of God. But whatever is of God will stand. Can you give me an amen? Would it, I'm going to say that again. Whatever is of God will stand. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, there was a verse that God, uh, or uh, it was a verse that, that, that here Paul was speaking into the Corinthians. And he's speaking about this sense of this seed that we're going to be talking about. And he said, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that, through he, uh, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. That you, through, <clears throat> that you through his poverty might become rich. What a scripture just to meditate on. He says that he became poor, for our sake. In other words, he was able to become something that he was never called to be, which was poor. Jesus was in heaven, and he took the form of humanity and became poor. The word poor there doesn't mean that he became poor with no money. The word there, poor, means that he became like you and I. The word poor means that he touched earth. By him becoming, leaving heaven and coming to earth, that's a big downgrade. Because in heaven, it is beautiful to see in the Bible how it tells us that the streets are made of gold. Crystals, waters, I mean, there's something beautiful about heaven. So when we think about this, that he became poor, he was rich, which, which, which was, he was, the richness means that he was in heaven and he came poor to come to earth. So you and I today could become rich. Well, that richness is talking about is heaven inside of you, is the Holy Spirit, is salvation. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about salvation. He's not talking about that he made you rich in money. He's talking about he made you rich in Christ. In other words, this scripture is telling me that at one time in my life, I was poor, a wretched man. But when I gave my life to Christ, he came inside of me. And now because he's inside of me, I'm rich. Amen, Pastor Mike. I believe that. Because he's a rich God that's inside of you. He is a generous God that's inside of you. This generosity, the God that's inside of you, the generosity, the God that you have is a generous, loving God that loves you more than you think that you know. He is greater than what your mind could comprehend. The Bible says that his love is as wide, as, as long, as his depth. He's not, under, not even understanding how deep 
his love goes. This type of, of um, poor, and then he made you rich, it's all over the Bible. You see it in the Old Testament, you see it in the New Testament, and you see the same thing consistently through the whole Bible in different areas. We're going to look at the Old Testament and how somebody was poor, and because God got involved, God made him rich. Now, what type of richness we're talking about? Come on. That's right. We're talking about having God. Can you give me an amen? And having God also produces on the outside. Finances and family and all that other good stuff. But when you talk about being generous, the power of generosity starts with having God. Now, before you came to God, remember, a lot of us were generous in the world, and a lot of us, you were never generous in the world. Well, praise the Lord, it didn't mean anything, because you didn't have the spirit of God. You had the spirit of the world. But when you accepted the spirit of God, it gave you a new identity to see the way you're supposed to see through God instead of seeing things through your natural man, which is the man that is uh, of the world, right? That man, that old flesh, right? The old way of things. This type of man that is constantly seeing things in a perspective of logic or the world will be a man that will constantly battle with problems in his life. Let me tell you something. The perspective in seeing life without God, and some of you, even though you have God, amen, you still see life like this, you see it with a logical mindset. You see everything accordingly to what you see, how you live it. In other words, if you can't see, you don't believe it. It's hard for you to comprehend what God is doing because your natural person through the bloodline and however you came um, has a negative sense in it that if the logical form of the world says if I do something, it has to benefit me. But if it don't benefit me, I don't need to do that. Why? Because it doesn't benefit me, so why should I do it? That's the logical sense of doing things. But when you see things through the richness in Christ, he lets you see beyond what you could see. He allows your spirit to do things that your natural man don't understand. Why are you doing that? It doesn't make sense for you to do that. Why are you putting yourself in that position to do that, knowing that in this position, look at the way you are. You're struggling. Your marriage is struggling. Your children are struggling. Your job, you're struggling with your job. You're struggling here. You're going through this. You're going through that. And look at, and so here with God, he's telling you to do something that's contradicting what you're going through here. He became poor here. He died here. He became poor so you could become rich here. So this rich man that you have, how many have this rich spirit inside of you? All right, 10 of you. I, I pray the rest of you really claim that. Amen. Amen. So the, the rich man that you have here, the battle that it goes through is not in the heart. Because if you accepted Jesus Christ, you have a good heart. The battle that you go through is in your mind. Right? We've heard messages like crazy, the battlefield of the mind, right? And that mind will constantly, this is why the Bible says you must renew your mind, because renewing your mind allows you to put your perspective in the eyes of the one that became poor to make you rich. So it gives you a new way of seeing things that this man over here don't understand. This man, this person over here that doesn't, see things with God's eyes, will always have a negative thing to say about that man. It just doesn't make sense. Why do I need it? It doesn't make sense. 
while I'm giving my life over here, I could be doing this to try to make something happen for my family. So I need to leave that so I could do this. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to give my life to Christ and to give time and to give my finances and to give um, time for counseling my kids. It doesn't make sense to teach my kids. It doesn't make sense because I, I'm not profiting. It seems like I'm not profiting nothing over here. But when I do something over here, I get profit because I'm moving under my talent of my ambition of my flesh. So now let's look at the Bible on how people lived in through the Bible. Because how many believe in the Bible? Now, there's a whole party that's trying to take away the Bible. If we don't be careful, we will not have, uh, we will be in trouble. So understand that that Bible is what empowers that word in that Bible, the promises in that Bible that were written, inspired by the Holy Spirit, empowers me to strengthen this man and to live accordingly to the man that lives inside of me, the new identity. The contradictor that is my mind is I constantly fight, I constantly not understanding because the logical man is always taking down the, faith, the man of faith. Well, I already tried the man of faith and I got to do things like this because I got hurt like this. Well, I understand that. I understand why you're hurt. The reason why you're hurt is because you've diverted back to your feelings and to the way you feel instead of keeping yourself in your eyes in Christ. So as soon as that you start looking things physically, of course you're going to get hurt here. Of course. You and myself, I'll be a miserable pastor today. But I have to make a choice. Everybody say choice. That choice determines how I'm going to act, who I'm going to activate that day and what I'm going to speak. Paul speaks about it very clearly, constantly. He says, don't get with somebody that's unequally yoked. What did, why did he say that? Why did he say, be careful, don't, 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 don't become unequally yoked? Why did he say that? The yoke, that word yoke means that whatever they believe in is going to sooner or later become you. Paul describes the fact of that we're not of this world, even though we're in it. It's a constant describing that there is this man and this man. And even though that this man is inside of us, we could live out this person over here. And so through the word of God, we see a couple of things that we see in first Kings chapter 17 verse 8 there is a story about the widow a widow what did this widow do we're gonna read a little verses and then we're gonna move on because I got a couple of things he said then the word of the Lord came to him saying arise to go to Seraphath which belongs to Sidon and dwell there see I have commanded a widow there to provide for you now 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 no, stop if this widow was on this side, I, I wish I had a sign right here, right? The old man, right? If this man was on this side, if this woman was on this side, the Bible says that God already entrusted this woman to do something without even seeing the prophet when he was going to come. He said, he says, see, I have commanded a widow. In other words, he already spoke to this widow to do something. It's powerful. Because many people that get spoken to think that it's a decision making of what I'm, like, let me make the decision. And it is your decision. It's your will. You could do whatever you want. But look at what it says. After she was spoken to the decision and she made the right decision, Verse 10 says this, look at what happens. So he arose and went to Seraphath, and when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks, and he called to her and said, please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, 
he called to her and said, please bring a, a morsel of bread in your hand. Now, it doesn't make sense. And it doesn't make sense to do that, right? And he says, so she said, as the Lord your God lives, I, don't, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour. In other words, it doesn't make sense for me to feed you in the middle of what I'm going through. You don't even know what I'm going through and you're telling me to do something that's contradicting what I'm going through. It doesn't make sense. You're telling me to feed you the last little bit that I got for me and my son and it's time for me to die after that? It doesn't... Look at your neighbor and tell him the things of God, the moments that don't make sense. That's right, tell him. It just doesn't make sense. Prepare for your, myself and my son that we may eat and die. Verse 13, it says, it says uh, and Elijah said to her, do not fear. See the first thing, what he says? He says, listen to me, I know that you're hearing the voice of reasoning. Look at me, look at me, everybody, everybody. You're hearing the voice of reasoning. The voice of reasoning gets you to listen to in place fearing you to do what God told you to do. See how fear was a factor and he spoke into her fear. And he says, don't be afraid. Don't fear. Go and do as you have said. Make me a small cake. Now, this woman didn't know that she already spoke to the prophet that there's a widow there. This widow don't even know yet. God already, God's already preparing her to do what the prophet's saying. She's going to be obedient to it because God knows she's going to be obedient. That's powerful how God could entrust you with something on earth to do that you don't even know that's going to benefit you. That's heavy to be entrusted. That, that is powerful to be entrusted on earth for God to do something. The Bible says, and afterwards, make some yourself and for your son. And verse 14, what did he say? He says, for thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day of the Lord. You know what he said? He said, I, I, could, I could give you a prophecy or even give you a word of the, I'm not going to do that. This point right here, he says, listen to me, my oil, my oil, my flower, my, my flower, the flower means the seed, means the bread that I am. What makes the bread, the flower that makes the bread. In other words, the oil, which is, which is the Holy Spirit, the bread, which is Jesus, the flower, which is Jesus. He says, it's never going to run out. Other religions will run out, but my relationship with you will never run out. I will never leave you nor forsake you, the Lord says. It won't run out. And because this woman took the, sand, the understanding of this, he says, verse 15, and, and, and then it says, it, says, it says, so she went away, did according to what, the word of Elijah, and she and her son and, and her household ate for, for how many days? Many days. Now she was getting ready to die. Reasoning doesn't matter. And her reason was like, you, you, you're telling me to do something that's contradicting logic. I, I, you're saying to give something out of my sense of being that I don't have. Let's look at another one in 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 8. Chapter 8, verse 8 through 10. And, and here's another story about a, 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 the Shunanite woman um, and this woman here this, this woman here God gives her a sense uh, to do something supernatural she saw a need this woman starts fixing up her room to get the prophet to come and stay in her room now what happened here the other woman Went to go get jars, if you read the whole story, beautiful story, and had enough oil and bread for many days. And even at that, he said, go ahead and support yourself half of it. This woman here, something supernatural happens. 
she calls the prophet, she calls the prophet, yeah, I was wrong, chapter four. She, she calls the prophet and she tells the prophet, come and stay in my house. And he says, now it happened one day that Elijah went to the Shunan, uh, Shunan uh, where, where there was a notable woman and she persuaded him to eat some food. So it was as often, in, and it goes on and she passes him and then she makes a room and she starts fixing up this room. And, and, and now Elijah comes and stays in that room. And then Elijah uh, uh, it tells his servant, which I believe is Gehazi, and later on that connects to another story. He tells him, go ask her, what can we do for her since she's been so generous? Look, look at how heaven's connecting to people. And he tells her, and he tells her, do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? And, and, he, and, and this woman tells her, tell, this woman tells him, I, I, I go bearless with no child. And I'm asking you to see you know, I would like to have a child. And then the prophet comes and says, at this time, at this year, you'll have a child. The miracle was not that the child was born because she couldn't give a child, which that was a miracle. But the miracle was afterwards that her child became a teenager. And that teenager, listen to this, listen to that. I want you to really pay attention. That teenager became ill and died. This woman goes back to Elijah and says, you gave me a son just for him to die? In other words, we, we, we came to church just to get divorced? We, we came to church just so we could be miserable and ugly? What, what did we come to Christ for? What was the reason why we got saved? We got saved because we needed God to come into our life. What was the point? And then Elijah tells her, take your son into the room. You know what room? The room that she was generous for him to do. That's heavy. I don't care how many times I read these stories. It's just powerful. She takes the boy and lays him on the bed. Elijah comes and lays on him. That's a whole other revelation. And the boy comes back to life in the room that she was generous with. Your generosity empowers your seed to birth out what you are not able to do. So one was the oil and the bread. The other one was a room. Let's look in the middle. Let's look in the middle in the book of Luke chapter 10, verse 33 to 37. We see a man. We see a man, a good Samaritan. What does he do? This man starts caring for the man that they just beat up. He starts caring for this man. Remember, the subject is he became poor so you could become rich. Remember that. How does he make you? How does these things happen? If you become a believer, you must understand that we don't submit ourselves under the world's government. We submit ourselves under the kingdom government. And so our system works different than the system that works for people that don't know Jesus. The way God works for us is that he starts developing the sense of something that he doesn't develop for others that don't have him. Those that are in Christ that see things through rich have a rich God inside of them, this richness that's inside of you is a favor that the world don't have. Some of you don't feel that favor. The reason why you don't feel that favor is because you have not activated the fullness of the seed of the rich seed that you have inside of you. It works. It works. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, by this time, the man that he's going to go help got beat up. They robbed him. They stole everything. And Jesus is telling the story. And he says, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he, he had, what did he have? He had what? He had what? Compassion. Generosity starts with compassion.
This woman was compassionate towards Elijah because he had nowhere to stay as he continued to journey and doing the work of God. This woman that gathers some sticks was gathering it for herself, but she listened to the prophet. The prophet gave her the word, and she did what the prophet said, and she got a multiplication. This man here, it's all over the Bible, by the way. I just picked a couple of them. This man, this is the spirit of the Christian. Did you know that there's 2.3 billion Christians on earth? You should have said amen to that. It amazes me that you're not even excited for that. Two point, there's 7 billion people on earth, and 2.3 of those, uh, 2.3 billion people are Christians. That's exciting. That's why they try to drag them. The Christian follows the values that we have from the Bible. And wherever our values are at, that's what we believe to go vote for. So we must be careful that we don't put ourselves to compromise the values that God gave us. I don't care if you agree with it or not, follow the values. Don't follow the man, follow the values. Do your homework and follow the values. What values, where's what? Where's what? Why am I speaking about that? Because the values that you raise your family could be stripped from you. Remember, this man was robbed. He was thrown to the street. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he, he had compassion. Verse 34, he, the Bible says like this. It says, so he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Now, what does oil and wine represent? Now, back in the days, they used to carry this to heal, right? The oil and the wine, again, represents the Holy Spirit and the new covenant, which is Jesus. And here he says, and he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. What did he do? He took care of him. Verse 37, after all of that, and Jesus said, he who showed mercy on him, then Jesus said to him, go and do, come on everybody, go and do. Do you see the spirit of generosity in the Bible? Do you understand how it matches? He was the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And that was one thing that, that was not challenged accordingly and any religion was to be generous. Generous, to be generous in the house of God. That is the seed that we carry. It's a generous seed. He goes, go do likewise. Go do what you do. You know what we do in this ministry? We take our time to build people. It's not a coincidence that we're growing the way we're growing. It's took in the, we barely got here three years ago. We were not at this, at this place and at this level. But many of you in the seats, like Ebedar, Pastor Everardo was saying, were broken and messed up by the way that you were living for Christ. And the word of God came to revive you. Those doors need to stay open, not because we want the building, because of the gospel we preach. He says, go and do likewise. Look at the book of Acts, chapter 9, verse 36. Let's go after the cross now. And at Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works. And, and you know, I don't like the word charitable, which is the right word right there. It's the same thing as uh, a, a generous, right? She, uh, she was very generous, generous deeds, which she did. But in ha it happened in those days that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Well, what did, what did uh, Tabitha do? She was in the ministry. Who healed her? God. But God used a man to bring her back to life. 
who she was connected to and where she gave is where her breakthrough came from. Look at what the Bible says. And when they washed her, they laid her in an upper room. 38. And since Lydia, Lydia was near Joppa, the disciples had heard that Peter was there. They sent two men to him, imploring him to, to not, him not to delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room. Man, there's something about that upper room. Because we saw it one time in the Old Testament. Now we see it again. We see here that in the upper room, we see something happen. You know that upper room, what it represents? That upper room today represents the church. It's where the brethren come together and fellowship. Do you know that your fellowship with the brethren in a church is very important? You know that today's generation says, I don't need to be connected to a church or anybody. I, could, I have my own fellowship in my little room in my own. That's good. That's a relationship. But do you know that the Bible says, do not forsake the assembling with God? I'm, uh, don't, don't, forsake, don't forsake for assembling with the saints? You know what that means is that he says, pertain with the saints. Don't be isolated. Connect yourself with the saints. Connect yourself with the church. Connect with somebody that you, you, so you won't be isolated. Why? Because there's going to be a time that you're going, to be have, you're going to be in need. And you need somebody to go and give you some word and to pray for you and to be there with you. Can you give them an amen? You need somebody to call. You know, there's very few that, that could call their pastor. But the truth this is that some of you, a lot of you could call. You call brothers in the church. Why? Because you get connected to people that could help you pray. That's why you need to get connected. When you're isolated, the devil likes to fight you alone. See, nobody's even calling you. Nobody cares for you. Nobody's discipling you. Well, it's not supposed to be about that. It's supposed to be you. They says, don't forsake the fellowshipping with the saints. It's connect with the people. Connect with brothers. Well, it's because I connect with people and they're just negative. I understand. Once they're negative, just depart from there. And tell them, be though, Pastor Mike said, amen, hallelujah. Say, peace out. That's not the family I want to hang around with. You're just talking about problems. I came here to get a hold of Jesus. Reveal Jesus to me. Can you give me an amen? And so what happened to Tabitha? Then Peter arose and went with them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room. And all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and the garments, the things that she was doing for the ministry, which Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all out. Come on, everybody say, put them, put them all out. Listen to me. Put out all those fake criers that are around you. There's a moment in your life that all the people that are crying around you are just people that are just carrying a burden, just speaking into you. They shouldn't be speaking to you. you, you you'll see them, people that don't focus on the word and not interested in, in getting connected with the word. You need to disconnect from that. Because those people are very emotional and they're not spiritual. Spiritual people will connect you directly to the spirit of God. Emotional people will connect you to your problem and try to help you out of your problem. I don't need you to help me. You're not my God. I just need you to speak to Christ inside of me. Because Christ will pull me out. Now if God uses you, praise God. But there's a lot of times that there's many people that are around your life. They don't need to belong there no more. That old compadre, those people that don't know Jesus, you, instead of you winning them over, they're winning you over. You carry their spirit now. And you don't even know you're being enticed by their philosophies and their way of thinking and their bravery of how they are in their flesh. God called you to humbleness, not to pride. Don't ever be prideful in doing something and feeling good about what you're doing. Humble yourself and take that off and say, God, you called me. I shouldn't be alive. You put me here. Can you give me an amen? You gave me my family back. Don't ever think that what you have can be taken away. The world is after you. This man over here, the old man, is always after for you to destroy everything God's blessed you with. Destroy your family by doing something ignorant. Destroy your business, destroy your income, destroy, destroy your, your, your job. Smart off to your boss, get frustrated and say something ignorant so that way you could lose what the little bit that God, is, that, that, that God could use on this side 
to make a miracle with. Stand and let God do what he needs to do. Can you give him an amen? Verse 41 says this. It says, he sat up and this is, then he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and the widows, he presented her alive. What was he? What was she? Alive. What was she? Alive. What sparked her resurrection? What sparked it? How did she become a story in the Bible? The Bible says that she was very what? Generous. Her generosity sparked up attention that empowered the man of God to come and lay hands on her and to raise her out of the dead. You know, something you must never teach your children is how to be how to control their money by being tight. Or let's say the right word and say greedy. The worst thing you could do is say, hold on to your money. You need to, you need, you need to hold on to it because you're not always going to have it. And they hold on to it like if they're never going to know because that's how the father and the mother taught them. And so when it's time for you to tell them, play with your friend and give them the toy. No, it's my toy. And they're fighting for the toy because that spirit of greediness is inside the bloodline. Why don't I know how to share? Because I come from the tree that don't know how to share. I come from a father that's always been greedy. So now my kids are fighting for, for a McDonald's hamburger and, and the sister's hungry too, but I can't give her half because the truth is, is that it's mine. And I'm hungry first. And let me eat and whatever I have left over in my fries, I'll give to you. And when children start acting this way, you start saying, you as a parent tell them, share, help. But yet, you don't understand that you created that. You need to tell yourself that. You need to tell yourself, how are you going to raise your children and you don't even do it yourself? Mom, dad, do you share? Are you generous? Are you part of the seed that you preach about us? Because all I hear about is for you complaining about money. All I hear is that you never have enough for bills. All we hear, there's never enough for nothing. And because there's never enough for nothing, that's what I believe. I believe that I'm never having enough nothing until that child rebels against his parents and says, I'm not going to live like that. And so now they become something different. And now you say, why is there a wedge there? The wedge is made because you created these values of these belief systems. that are ideologies of my feelings of how I've lived life. And so now, how could I raise my child? How could I raise a family? How could I raise a good marriage? And how could I raise my life to be a man and a woman that's able to be successful? Well, the truth is, is that I got to practice who the one that lives inside of me to believe that God is able to do greater things. And if I can't teach that to my children and my children don't see me, if, if, if people don't see me as an example to say, man, that man, that woman, they're so generous. They're, man, they're, they'll take their shirt off your back just to help you. They're, they're able. They're, they're, they're godly people. Oh, dad's going to say it, but he's not going to do it. He always breaks his word. He always says that. Uh, Dad gets all excited and got an envelope for grace giving, puts it on the dash of board, and the kids know that that's not going to be fulfilled because we're not even going to show up that day. That's the day we're going to go somewhere else. Because you break your word. You're not a man of your word, a woman of your word. Because this type of preaching doesn't allow you, doesn't allow you to act the way you want to act. It tells you this is the man that you are. And you've allowed circumstances on this side to take you away from who I am on this side. I'm preaching better than you're saying amen. In Acts chapter 20, verse 30, verse, <clears throat> verse 1, 2, 3, and 4, and the whole chapter, we spoke about it a little bit last week. We talked about Cornelius. It was a man that created a revolution he says i have shown you in every way 
Oh, let, let's go. Let's go to verse. Let's go to verse three. Verse two. Verse two. Twenty. Verse two. He says, "Now when he had gone over that region, and he, and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece." Verse three. And he stayed three months. And when the Jews plotted against him, as he was about to sell to Syria, he decided to return. So he goes back. And in verse 4, he says, he says, and so uh, he goes, keeps on going. And, and in verse 5 and 6, 5, we're going we're gonna to skip a lot just for the sake. He says, this man going ahead waited for us to Troas. Verse 7, verse, verse 7. And then it says, now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart, the next day spoke to them and continued this message until midnight. And then something starts to happen. And they were in the upper room. In that same room, in, 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 a, in an upper room, it seems like that, that empowerment of that upper room, is, it's, it seems like there's something when you get into personal with Christ. It, says, it starts talking about a man named Cornelius. In this verse, in this chapter, I mean, he starts talking about a man, Cornelius. And this man, the Bible says, last week I said, how this man was a giving man. He was a giving man. Oh, it's in Acts chapter 10. I'm sorry. Acts chapter 10, 1, 1 through 4. That he was a giving man. Go to verse 4 or 3. And it says that about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius, verse 4, he says, and when he observed him, he was afraid. Something about that fear, right? And he said, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, your prayers and your alms, which is your generosity, have come up for a memorial before God. Now, this is after the cross. Because this man was generous, he turned a whole generation that was supposed to meet God. This is one of the first Gentiles that's being reached in the Bible. And, and, and in verse 11, we're going to be skipping. In verse 11, the Bible says that Peter, something happened to Peter. Because of this transaction, Peter was not accepting to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to a Gentile or to Cornelius. Because Cornelius, they believed different than Peter believed. But God had spoken because of your alms, because of your giving, because of who you are as a person. I'm bringing the breakthrough to you. He brings Peter to him. Peter comes and has an open vision in heaven. Listen to me. Beautiful the day is when you die and meet Jesus. That's going to be a beautiful day, my brothers and sisters. The Bible says that the heaven was open. You know, we are in a time today called a third wave awakening. Let me tell you something about that sense of awakening. This is the first time. See, there's been three revivals. Why we call it the third wave is a three revivals. We understand that through lifetime we've had many revivals. When the African American were released from slavery, they started worshiping. The Bible says that people, the Bible says, the, the, the history says that, these, that people started raising their hands and being broken before God, thanking God for them being free. Revival broke out. The Azusa revival. Where people were laid out in the streets. God was touching people left and right. And we are on a third wave revival. This revival that God is about to do, the, the word has been coming out and being revealed and lies have been being beat down. Religion has been being exposed and the truth has been spoken to the people. This revival is not a revival about people just being laid out, which is going to happen. 
But this revival is a revival that's going to awaken the people. That's what happened to Cornelius, where fathers and mothers wake up with revelations and speaking to their children. And their children will wake up saying, man, I saw a vision. Mom, I don't know what I, I had this dream about heaven. I saw God. And, and they start seeing this. It's a third wave revival. Here, here comes and doesn't understand this. He don't understand that God's trying to reach Cornelius. And so God opens the heaven and shows him the animals because he didn't agree on the way Cornelius ate. They ate pork. Some of us don't like pork. But they ate pork and pork back then was a no-no because it was a dirty animal. And he says, I'm not getting close to them because of the way their values are, the way they serve God. They compromise. They're this, they're that. And they start pushing away. Listen to me, this revival, this awakening that's happening, it's not just being about the saying, be generous to the church to be a giving. It's not about an envelope. This is about a breakthrough that today we're living in such a depressed time where people are in bondage. Marriages snip at each other and fight for days, get happy for three days, fight again and they get happy again and then fight again and they've lived that life for many years and God says I'm going to set you free from your misery and live good in your marriage I wanted to explain that that's why I was going once one story at a time how it led you all the way to after the cross it's the same spirit it, generosity never changed but here's something, generosity changed a whole generation. A whole generation. Here Cornelius comes and is waiting for something to come. He don't understand what he's wanting the man of God to come to him. He don't understand why God's saying, listen to me, I know your family's always been Catholic. I know you've always been at this religion. You've never gone to church. They didn't teach you this, but I'm bringing you somewhere that's maybe a little awkward. You might not understand what I'm trying to do, but I'm going to use you because your family might be going through some things and I need you to represent me in your family because your mother might want to become a suicide. Your father might want to leave your mother. So you're going to be the light inside your home. And you don't even know that's going to happen. Some of you fathers that surrender yourself, to humble yourself, to come back to church. Because I know some men. They're very uh, isolated men. They love, we don't need to go to church. We could do it from TV. Let's go, honey. Let no, and then the, here comes the kids. I want to go to church. All right, let's go. And you humbled yourself to be here. That's what I'm talking about, a revival happening. When mothers humble themselves, not to their children, but to themselves. When women know that you can't do it alone, sister. There's a revival that's about, that's being moved. The word that's coming out of the pulpit is not a word just to say, oh, that's a good church that preaches the word. No, this is a movement. It's a revival. It's an awakening in families. It's men of God that have been serving God for 20, 30, 40 years, maybe even pastoring. Maybe they were hurt somewhere and God says, here's the word. I'm going to raise you up because I've always called you, but I know you're not going to accept it because it's not going to make sense because the two clash because you're so mad and so hurt but I'm about to do a new thing there's an awakening happening with you it starts with me and you at three in the morning me and my wife were having a you know we were down all week man Thursday I get better and then boom she's down right now going through battle all week like a specific attack against our bodies. And yesterday we were in the kitchen all beat up. You know, all night will. Come on. Right? Talking about the great, the greatest awakening that earth has not yet understood. All this travailing that's happening amongst the political world and amongst the wars, the people when the prime minister of Israel comes over to our country and, and they, they start to bash 
Israel. And just like he said in the Senate, he said, I'm not fighting for the fact of Israel just to be Israel. I'm fighting because this is where Abraham was and this is where David was from. This is where Solomon was from. This is where our, our foundation. In other words, what he's saying is this is where America was born from. It was born from God and God we trust like our money says. You know where that statement came from, right? In God we trust. Your money tells you to trust God. You're the only one that doesn't do it. That's the foundation of our country. That's where it was made from. Our forefathers said, put that on the paper so we could never trust this paper. We will always trust the God that's going to bring us this paper. In verse 35, something happens. In verse 35, it says, But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. This is the, the birthing to the Gentiles. And he says, listen to me, listen to me, you Gentiles. Listen to me, those that have been part of different philosophies of how you believe. There's one statement you should never forget an understanding. This statement has been ignored in the church for many years. You tell them that, well, we know that, but let's take, let's go to meat. No, that's milk. This is meat. The meat is that whoever fears him and works, 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 what's works righteousness? Does the work, the good work, works the seed that's inside of them, that's generous, that put this work of righteousness. You can't, you can't come and do ministry and, and you don't believe in generosity. There's no way. There's no way the two are clashing. Your spirit is serving a different God than your body's serving. Imagine somebody coming and singing, Caleb, one of the worships is, In God we trust, we love you. We are so generous, Lord. And, there, and the, the person that's singing is not even generous. Imagine. Imagine, you cannot live out the seed that you have. It doesn't make sense to serve a God that you don't believe in the values of who he is. It doesn't, it doesn't, it was, well, we're not saved by works. No, we're, we're not saved by works, but the work that we do have is to do the good work. It's powerful when we start coming and understanding Cornelius comes and he says, listen to me, there's a new revival happening. God puts the spirit of Jesus. He speaks the word to Cornelius. Cornelius takes it to the Gentiles. The Gentiles start coming. You know what the spirit today is? The spirit of work without righteousness is those people that are busybodies and don't know how to listen to the word of God. People that are minds are constantly going. Thought, your, your, phone, your phone already blew up 10 times just sitting here. Why? Because you're so busy and on, on everything else. You're so busy. You're not attracted to what's being preached. And the third wave awakening is that awakening people from their slumber, from the one that's sleeping inside of them. There's a giant sleeping and his name is Jesus. He's inside and he's getting ready to do something in your life. Your dream of becoming a pastor has not died. Your dream of being an evangelist has not died. Your dream of being a business owner has not died. It's just sitting there right now. God's about to produce something greater than you are. But he's saying, live it out, son. Live out righteousness. Live out righteousness. Quit playing church. Quit playing politics. Looking around, let me see if, if he came to church. Oh, he didn't come, watch. Today, watch, watch. You're playing politics, man. You gonna do this or not? You're playing politics with yourself. You're trying to convince yourself that what you need to do is let this flesh man answer to the need that you need in your life. And God's saying, I'm God. I'm your Abba. I know what you need. 
If you needed that, I would have gave it to you. But I have you there because you need to learn how to humble yourself, son. You're so proudful. You're so arrogant. You think you have it all. But listen to me. You do confess me, but you're far, you're far from my power. Be careful who's discipling and talking to you because you start becoming like them. Be careful. Be careful what sisters you're sitting there and praying because afterwards they start telling you all their problems and all those problems are messing your head up because you're going through the same thing problems. Be careful. Be careful. People are supposed to inspire you. And if those people are not inspire you, you don't need that. They're supposed to give you word, man. They're supposed to, let's, let's say, I need word. I need a word. I need a word. Third wave on awakening. Cornelius, you're going to start a revolution that's going to reach 2024 now, that was not said in the bible but imagine this it was passed on that was the mecca of christianity that's where christianity was passed on to a dirty type of people the mecca the time of the encounter where peter sees the coming heaven had to open for peter for him to understand like peter quit being prideful it's okay for you to eat carnitas for those that don't know, amen. Uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. It's okay, Peter. I've reached those people too. I've called those people too. I love those people too. Peter, stop being stingy with the power that I've given you. Share it. Pass it. Give it. Do something with it. Last week we, we understood that generosity was the seed planted in us. This week we understand that generosity is a seed that plants a tree in, outside of us. Remember a seed, a seed becomes a tree. You're called to give out of you. the first thing that God opens up for God so loved the world that he gave now everybody uses it as an offering but I wouldn't use it as an offering you know what I would use it as for God so loved the world that he gave his seed inside of you it's not an offering scripture it's a seed scripture you have more than you think you have stop thinking so much in that shower stop thinking so much about everything let faith run its course he's a god that doesn't fail you 